All right. We will call the meeting to order. Okay. Uh, Gil will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Again. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll have roll call. Would you like me to start here? Would you like to start, Mary? Uh, how about I'll start real quick? All right. Uh, let's see. Mr. Blum. Mr. Osborne. Mr. McNicky. Present. Mr. Ramirez. Ms. Kay. Ms. Watson. Ms. Broughton. Ms. Soleil. Mr. Bayard. Here. And Mr. Gibson. Here. Okay, El Centro. Mr. Larson. Here. Mr. Abadi. Here. Mr. Anderson. Here. Mr. McFadden. Here. Mr. Nunez. Here. Mr. Perez. Here. Mr. Zendejas. Here. Ms. Thomas. <coughs> Ms. Gomez. Present. Staff in the audience we have here, uh, Gloria Rivera, Secretary to the Board, and uh, Antonio Ortega, Government Affairs. Okay. Uh, Draft of the minutes were mailed to all of you, with the exception of Mark, which may have fell out of his envelope. So each of you should have a uh, copy in your packet. Uh, please let me know if you found any errors or, or any corrections. Move for approval. Bayard. Second. Second. Blum seconded. Blum second. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. All, the, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Aye. Okay. Abstain. One up from Mark. We have one abstain from uh, Mr. Larson in El Centro. Over here. Okay, move it a uh, minute. Uh, um, so moved. Okay, moving on so, to public comment period. This is a public meeting. And this is the time for public comment. At this time, you may be heard on any item not listed on the agenda. Those who wish to address the committee should come to the microphone and state your name and address an address for the record. The chair reserves the right to limit the speaker's time, and we request that you limit your remarks to no more than five minutes. The meeting period will be limited to 10. The comment period would be limited to 10 minutes. Please note, the committee may make recommendation make a recommendation on any item on the agenda. And there does not appear to be anybody in El Centro in how about La Quinta? None here. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item four, the twenty thirteen proposed budget plan by Sandra Ainsworth. Are you going to drag it or can you like click it? Okay, I'll click it. Where's the camera where I'm looking into? Okay. Okay. Good evening, Sandra Ainsworth, Finance Department. I'm going to give a high level overview tonight of the Energy Department's 2013 operating budget. <clears throat> so the first slide that we have is a summary, a very high level summary of the operating budget, the expenses. So you'll see that yeah. the 2013 budget was total was 400 and just short of $423 million. The 2013 proposed budget is uh, four, $436 million just short. And what is driving the increase, that's a 3% increase from 2012. And what is driving that increase, you'll see a large increase in the power supply, fuel and purchase power line item. And that is essentially being driven by the renewable portfolio standards, the renewable energy that we will be purchasing. Uh, that is what dr is driving that increase. And then in the operations and maintenance expense, for the most part, the department uh, was working under the mandate to make a 5% reduction to the operating budget over the 20. 12 operating budget. However, we do have uh, the public benefits budget where there are 
some programs, one being de demand reduction program that has been previously funded in the 12, 2012 budget under the fuel and purchase power budget. And what we are doing in 2013 is assuming that we will fund that out of operations and maintenance. We wanted in the power supply budget, since it was already increasing, uh, being driven by the renewable portfolio standards, we wanted to go ahead and make that adjustment in 2013. Are there any questions on this slide? Yeah. Can you um, bear yes. with us for a moment here? Uh, Marion, uh, we can't see the slides on the uh, screen down here. Um, when we set it up, we could, but we can't right now. So we're reading I've got right, some handouts. We're reading right out of the handouts. There. So it's all central. You, can't see them. Oh. We're following uh, the handouts, so just have to bear with us. I'm going right off of the handouts. It, did you hand out the, the version that was emailed? Yes. So it, it has not changed from the version that you currently have, the hard copy. Thank you, Sandra. We'll follow along then. Just uh, let us know what page we're on and just to kind of go along. Okay. Like, all right. Going to the question. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Sandra, the, the, the increase that we talked about or, the, or you just mentioned, um, is that the portfolio I understand with the requirement for energy savings is that uh, is that a requirement of AB 32 that is indeed so. a requirement so what that entails is we are required to be at a 20% level of renewable resources for the first compliance period which covers 2000 and 11 through 2013 to Belen Valenzuela are you there is Belen Valenzuela present She's it's not with us here. I just I just drew a blank. 2014. It is through uh, 2011 through 2013 is that first compliance period, and we are required to be at 20 percent. So we are currently sitting right at about 20 percent for 2012, and we will actually be, I believe, at about 26 percent for 2013. And the reason for that is that we were actually short coming in from 2011, so we needed to make up some of that difference since it's a three-year average. Okay. And that's a requirement of the law, the three-year average. That is a requirement. So in other words, you could be 15%, 15%, and then 30% to keep. That's correct, okay. as long so, as you hit that three-year average. So the increase is driven by the fact that we didn't make it the earlier. That is correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any more questions on this slide? Yes, Mr. Body, go ahead. <clears throat> Mrs. Ainsworth, uh, you said that um, the money from fuel and purchase power you're giving to operation and maintenance for the programs... I guess uh, I guess that is that amount around six million dollars, and according to my figures, that you're going to do well, that work. That's that those awards, those awards that were um, through, I guess through your um, whatever um, the format is, about six million dollars came from fuel and purchase power to the public. That's benefits. actually five million dollars um, that five was million? budgeted for. Yeah, five million. Yes. Uh, why, why are they putting in the operation and maintenance to have them do that work and at $5 million? Why isn't it a project expense? <coughs> well, it's not a, a project expense. It's, it's a cost of operation. So what we've done, I believe 2012 was the first year. And what we did at that time is we said, let's go ahead and, and fund these demand response programs where we will, or demand reductions, where we would actually be looking, uh, the public benefits group would be working with, with local, local customers to go out and see, um, you know, if they could curtail some of their generation. It's actually less costly for us to go out to the customer and to buy demand capacity from the customer than it is to go out to market. So the, those are what those programs uh, are aimed at doing. And the thought this year is, is that instead of funding those through the demand or through the through the power supply budget, which essentially the ECA will roll through the ECA, that since we already have funds that are sitting in excess 
in the fund balance account to the extent, uh, I think to the tune of about 19 million or 20 million dollars that I believe this committee has discussed in the past, that instead of hitting the customer again and passing that through the ECA, that we would instead go ahead and use part of those fund balance funds to actually pay for those programs, that program rather. <coughs> Uh, Mike, are you done? Yeah. Because I think, Sandra, you brought up another thought. I'm saying, I, I say to myself, if we're going to be, I'm going to call it a euphorism robbing Peter to pay Paul, uh, how are we going to make that money up in the future? That's something that the public benefits group is working with Belen Valenzuela, who's now the assistant manager in charge of that area. And they are actually looking at that and making some long-term plans strategically to determine what that answer is going to be. What, where do we need to go? What they're looking, I think, as this group knows, they're looking at all their programs. Mm -hmm. What programs make the most sense for IID's customers in this service territory? So they're taking a strategic look at all of that to make a determination. Okay, so we're, I know there was something like $9.3 million discussed <clears throat> at, a, at a subcommittee meeting. I'm concerned about how we're going to keep that money flowing in to get it to the customers who need it. Is that, am I on another subject or? No, that, it's a good question and that is what they are doing strategically. Like I said, they are taking a long, hard look at A, what are the best programs for our load profile and our customer base in, in this service territory and B, how best to fund them. And if we do look at drawing down that fund balance, then how do we operate on a going forward basis? And, and that's something they're, um, in the early stages of looking at. Okay, so we'll have a resolution quickly then. That They're looking at that very closely. Um, they're going to need to to make a determination, I would say, within the next three to four months so that they know strategically how they're going to move forward. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Question. Mr. Abadi, Mr. did Brown. I answer your question? He has oh. a question for you. <clears throat> uh, just to follow up, Mrs. Ainsworth, uh, of the five of the 12 million, I believe I saw in the budget in the presentation to going through it all. <clears throat> uh, does the administrative cost associated that also fall into O and M, or does the administrative cost still stay with the the remainder of nine million? The administrative costs are picked up within the public benefits program. We had that structured when it was going to flow through the ECA so that no internal labor would hit that ECA. Those costs are not allowable. And I believe, I'm gonna to look to Diana Rosas, but I believe that's still a correct assumption. Yes. Th that is, so there are no administrative uh, expenses that at this time have been associated with those programs. And in addition, since they're just developing the programs, we we haven't done too much with that. They're taking a look at uh, what that actually would entail, how much internal staffing time and administrative expense would be involved with that. Okay. So uh, I would imagine we would have that refined within the next budget cycle. <clears throat> okay, the, uh, the, the rates are, the base rate in the ECA, you charge 2.85% uh, what the board voted for, but you apply it to the ECA, not only the base, but the ECA. That 2.85% that's collected from the ECA portion of the rate structure, is that able to be used for, uh, I guess, administrative? Or how's that being used? <clears throat> Well, the 2.85% that is collected on the ECA in general, because it is, it is associated with the public benefits and no longer part of the EC, or not part of the ECA, in general, yes, administrative costs, um, I believe it's approximately $1.5 million that is included in this year's $24 million public benefit budget and approximately 1.5 million is for administrative cost of that 24.3 million. So you, uh, the ECA rate, you can use 2.85%, you just can't use the other 97% for administrative purposes. Ask me that again, please. <clears throat> the 2.85% that you're collecting under, on the rate, on the ECA, that can be used for administrative. The other 97% of the, of the ECA rate cannot be. Is that correct? 
Well, I want to make a clarification. These are not ECA dollars. They are public benefits dollars that are being collected on base rate revenues and ECA rate revenues. And I would say that those funds, to the extent that we have administrative costs, they can be covered under that 2.85% that is collected on total rates. Okay, and that's a board resolution. No, that's no longer a state mandate. It's not required. Uh, the, the state has gone back out and issued new, I believe, they issued some new requirements. But what the board did say when we went is just, let's just leave it alone. We, we did take that back to the board. At the time, the PBC was conceptually going to sunset because they had not extended it at the end of 2011. Uh, and at that time, the board said, you know, we, we still need to have these programs. Let's just go ahead and keep it in place. Okay, uh, one other question. What's a megawatt hour cost in solar or the high end? <clears throat> or a megawatt or a megawatt hour? Well, I can tell you, is it, Belen, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Thank so. you. <laughs> I will let the expert answer that question. No, it's approximately about 105 megawatts. $105 per $105, megawatt. uh-huh. Per megawatt hour or per megawatt? Per megawatt, mm-hmm. Hmm. And generally, solar has about a 23% capacity factor, meaning, that it's on about 23% of the time. So even though you sign out like a 20 megawatt contract, you have to remember out of the whole day, it's on about 20% 20, 20 of the time of that day. Hmm. So. Ms. Valenzuela, we haven't seen the, the, the energy stack of your the, the procurement on, you know, um, I understand uh, we, we've made our 26% of the renewables. What is the average, would you say, from the of the thousand megawatts that you guys burn here, what would you say just the average best guess. cost of the green or the both just an average best guess? Oh gosh, I don't know. The, you know, I'm I'd have to go back and calculate that only because there's a combination of what they call base load, which has a different capacity factor, like your geothermal, your biomass compared to the solar. I'd have to go in and um, I'd have to compute that. But that's okay. I could tell you, generally, you're looking at like a geothermal biomass, about $90 a megawatt, solar about 105 Right now, your conventional gas-fired are running probably about $35 a megawatt. Not just because of the way market prices are on natural gas right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions? El Centro? Mm -hmm. No more questions here? Well, then I'm going to go ahead and proceed to slide four. Thank you. Slide four is a summary of the capital budget. What you'll see between 2012 and 2013, it's pretty static uh, for transmission and distribution. You'll see a large decrease for generation. Of course, that is driven primarily by the fact that we have completed the El Centro 3 project and we don't have any large projects in the 2013 budget for generation. In addition, there's a slight, there's an, a 30% increase in other capital projects and that consists of two main drivers, one being the completion of the SOC, the backup for the Systems Operations Center. And in addition, we will be starting a replacement of the 800 megahertz radio system. The equipment that we have is very outdated. It's no longer supported. So we've got a three to four year rollout program to completely upgrade that system and update it. Those are the, the two main drivers between the capital. And then the centralized services portion, that energy department's portion of that has decreased by about 15%. We're really trying to work with the departments and <coughs> essentially within the whole organization, you know, we're tight, we've got some constraints on cash and um, operating reserves, so we're trying to operate within those. So we've made several areas we've reduced in the 2013 budget. Are there any questions on the capital budget? None from El Centro. 
Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and move on to slide five. This is a recap of the revenue projections. A couple of big assumptions in the revenue assumptions. So we're assuming a 2.71% load growth. We are actually seeing load picking up in the last year or so, so we are projecting that. Um, and then we've got the retail rates under the base rate revenues. You'll see that we have the 2013, uh, 2012 budget at 366 million, whereas we're budgeting 387 million in 2013. The assumption in that figure is that there will be a base rate increase of one cent effective February 1st, 2013. We're currently looking at scheduling some public workshops in January. I don't have those dates with me, but two workshops in January uh, to try and have that rate increase adopted. So this budget is based on a cons assumption of 11 months with that base rate increase. Then in addition, you'll see these line items four and five. And what these items are is we are making an assumption that we are going to bring in $25 million of previously deferred revenue from the rate stabilization fund, which currently has a balance of $100 million. And in the 20,000, excuse me, 20, the 2012 budget resolution, the board directed staff to bring in funds from the rate stabilization fund to offset increases being driven by the renewable power supply, the RPS standards, so that will insulate the customers from rate increases as soon. So what it's looking like is that we would start in 2013 and we would utilize 25 million for years 2013 through 2016. And that amounts to a credit to the customer. One of the assumptions I, I didn't mention is in the base rate revenue, the other assumption is that the ECA rate would be 2.56 cents. Uh, the board has given direction that they want the ECA to start floating on a monthly basis. So we went in, we took a look, and said, if effective February 1st, we float the ECA, then what would be the average for the year? And then we actually calculated the monthly ECA rates as well. So the assumption is that with this $25 million rate stabilization offset, in addition to line five, which is the ECA collection balance, and that's the amount that we over collected in 2011, once the board reestablished the ECA according to the rate schedule, where we were at, um, we, we are projecting that for 2012, we'll consume approximately $6 million of that over collection. The months from August forward so far um, have had under collection. So we are seeing that we're starting to utilize some of that balance. So we're projecting that we would have approximately $31.5 million. The customer would receive the benefit of that credit as well in 2013. So the ECA calculation, or the assumed ECA rate of 2.56 cents assumes the this 25 million and the $31.5 million offsets in 2013. That's where the customer will, will benefit from a lower ECA. Are there any questions about the ECA? Gil, and we have a question, Gil? Yes. Um, the, the question I have is, are we going to see, w will the rate payers see that uh, a, a credit on their bill, or how is that going to be handled if they're... I was looking for the voice. Excuse me, <laughs> Mr. Blum. Well, actually, they'll, they'll see a lower ECA rate. So right now, the ECA is currently being billed at 3.24 okay. cents, and they'll see a 2.56. So they're going to be receiving a reduced ECA of, of approximately, well, it won't quite be 1.6, but these credits amount to 1.6 cents. <clears throat> okay. So unless they are aware of what their bill says from month to month, they, don't, they really won't realize, well, I guess if they look at their bill, they will realize that there is a lower, their bill is lower? No. Will they, will they act, will it be reflected in a lower bill? I guess that's where I'm going. What, what we will be doing in January, at the same time we send out, that we send out notifications about the rate increase, the proposed rate increase and the public hearings, we also let them know um, if things don't change, if the board doesn't give us subsequent direction, um, 
I would imagine that we'll put flyers together and we'll put bill stuffers together because we want to make sure, sure. that yeah. they understand and they see that impact and that they know specifically their bill has, their rate has decreased and why it has decreased. You're welcome. So, okay, uh, quite. Mr. Perez, have a question? Yes. Yes, uh, overall, you're going to try to increase or going to increase the base rate by one cent, am I correct? And then- That's the proposal. What's that? What did you That's say? the proposal, she said. Okay, and then, and you're gonna lower the ECA rate down, or, or is it gonna be offset, uh, are you gonna offset that one cent some way, somehow? Or the customer's gonna well, see the, an increase overall? They are not associated. There will be an overall increase. Um, 0.75. Yeah, I, I can tell you, I did not come prepared with that number, I should have, but I can tell you that the total rate, even after a one cent base rate increase, even before we lower the ECA to 256, would end up in a lower total rate than the customer was paying in 2010. And I don't have that information, um, Mr. Perez, but I can, I'd be happy to provide that to Marion so she could pass it on to this committee after this meeting? Thank you. So in short, in summary, the answer is that they're, they're not tied together. So we are going to be floating the ECA, so the ECA will be adjusted according to what the projected power supply costs are, in addition, in conjunction with the credits that we will receive. And then we can only use the ECA, as you're all very well aware, of, for power supply costs. So we have not had a, a base rate in our power rates since 1994, so that's close to 20 years. And certainly I know we all know that costs haven't remained static over the last 20 years. So that's, that is what's driving the need for the base rate increase. Question over here. I think I saw another question. Yes. Yeah, this is Mark Larson. Um, page five, or maybe it's your slide five. You have a year-end projection of 2012 as the average kilowatt sold at 11.79, 11.79 cents. And your 2013 budget um, is anticipated to be 13.77 cents. To me, that looks like that's a two cent, per, two cent increase and not a one, per, one cent increase. Well, part of that is driven by the ECA and by the costs that are rolling through the ECA. So the, the ECA will be decreasing. And that is an, that is an average and That's based on the total revenue. I'm thinking through this. I'm thinking out loud. Sorry about that. Because it's not an effective rate increase um, of 2%. Actually, what it ends up coming to, that one cent will actually represent approximately, I believe, 10.5% increase to the customer as, as a whole. We have another question. Go ahead. Mrs. Ainsworth, uh, just uh, <clears throat> recall a memory. Every one cent increase represents about thirty-four million dollars in revenue. That's correct. And if you add the thirty-four million dollar for one percent or one cent increase in the base, and then you also add a twenty-five million that you're bringing out of the rate stabilization. Uh, are you planning to use the whole 31 million you have in the over collection of the ECA also in the same one year or is that going to be divided out over four like the rate stabilization? Thank you for that question, Mr. Body, because you just um, jiggled my memory a little bit. Um, actually, to the last question, I'll answer your question, Mr. Larson. The answer is because the, the reason that number is showing so large because that includes that $58 million of, or $56 million of offsets for credits that we would be bringing in. That's what is making that appear larger, that average revenue per KWH. That is the answer to your question. I should have been able to pick up on that. And Mr. Abadi, Please ask your question again. Okay, well, uh, here, Mrs. Ainsworth, here's what I'm looking at. If I look at the four, uh, $454 million that you need, 
based on your sales, you're going to need 13.77. But in my looking at all these numbers I have below that, and your deferred revenue, uh, you don't need 13.77 because you have 20, you have nearly 56 million dollars, almost 57 million dollars sitting right here. Mm-hmm. Well, there are two things that are driving the need for the base rate increase. It's based on financials. Um, and what is dri- driving that is that we have a requirement to keep our debt service ratios, our debt service coverage at two times. And in addition, the board has given the mandate that they want to keep operating cash at approximately $125 million. Mm-hmm. And those two figures are a large part of what dro- is driving the need for a base rate increase. Uh, question this is mark again um you know i'm sitting here trying to understand what you've told us how how are we going to explain this to the public that you've taken money uh and put it in the budget from the places you over collected from them before and you're moving 31 million dollars down here from i don't know pie in the sky or whatever we're supposed to be able to you know kind of be transparent here and to me I'm pretty confused myself of course I just got the budget here a few minutes ago but anyway um, I'm a little confused myself so I guess between now and I guess our next meeting there'll probably be some other questions you can probably answer for us Uh, did, did were there another, was there another question? Mr. Abadi looked like he was pondering a question. Mr. McFadden has a question. Go ahead. Could you please explain the one percent increase that you asked for again? What is the total amount of that one percent that you are going to be requesting? One cent. One, one cent. cent. But I mean, when it totals up, though, what is the total revenue that you're going to generate from that? If it was a full year, Mr. Body was pretty much right on the mark. It's approximately $35 million. So for 11 months, I believe the number was right at about $31.5 million. Okay, uh, next question is, out of the public benefits fund, and we have like 20 million, and I guess I want this to go to the subcommittee, I'm looking for a creative, innovative way to get some money back to the ratepayers and not have a rate increase. And I think that, and I'm, I'm not, I don't think this has been looked at, I just want to explore it. Is there a way that we can take some public benefit money and return to the ratepayer with a combination of some other funds? And I just want to explore that, that there's been a lot of overcharging, a lot of people don't understand what we're doing now, I just want to have a discussion about giving back to the community ratepayers. Now, I understand that uh, someone said it's 34 million or something you're going to come up with. If we can't come up with 34 million, can we look at something for seniors and low income consumers? But all these things that we're talking about is like pie in the sky and the ratepayers. I want to see them get something back in their pocket. Things were taken out of their pocket. And at least we have a discussion about how to get something back. And I'm thinking that a portion of public benefits, can that be explored? Just for a discussion. Now, if it has to go to our subcommittee or some committee, and and I've been talking about public benefits for a long time, and we haven't had these kind of discussions. IID can give you a whole list of things that they need to do with public benefit money off the top of their head. They can always have a project. I just want us to have a conversation about returning money to the ratepayer. Just like they took money from the ratepayer, they overcharged the ratepayer, and nobody's having a discussion about how to get money back to the ratepayer. And I would just like to explore public benefits, and I don't say put it all back to the ratepayers because there may be some other uh, community benefits, but I just want this discussion to take place. So, um, and I don't know if I need to make that in form of a motion to get that action looked at and reported back. We can have, 
we can add it to our next uh, subcommittee meeting. It, it we'll send it to Marion to add to the agenda. Okay, and the reason for that is that I don't want this to come up after the budget's approved. No. I'd like to have this discussion before the budget's approved and explore this process of returning revenue to the ratepayer. Okay. Just right. like we took it. I understand. Okay. Mr. Right. McFadden, I'd just like to make one clarification okay. and reiterate okay. that, in fact, we will be giving back to the ratepayer $56 million of rate stabilization and ECA over collection. So we are actually actively planning on giving funds back to the customers that they paid. Let me say that to you, let me, I, I don't want to get into a, a conversation about this, but I clearly understand that is on the board and for discussion, and I just want to explore this possibility. I'm not saying do it. i just like to have a discussion, and I understand what you've been saying all night long. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any more questions well, we about the question? ECR base? Yes, we have a question yes. down here. Is your, can you, Mike, can you, there we go. Here, Mike, she's working on the mic. Okay. Will that be in the form of um, a, a rebate, or you're going to give them give them back the difference uh, in terms of a, uh, a, a a draft check, or, or how are you, how are we giving it back? We are lowering their ECA rate that will be billed to them from 3.24 cents to 2.56 cents. Based on our response, I would agree that, that that we discussed that in a subcommittee meeting because that's not necessarily, um, in my opinion, really giving back. We've taken from them, and and now we want to use another method. I, I think we need to explore that possibility of looking a, 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 about a rebate or, or something. We, we need to explore that possibility. So, uh, Freddie, you going to put that on the agenda for the but sub, it, sub Yes, if you would uh, send me your those concerns, those uh, discussions, it'd be an uh, email, and uh, we would have to coordinate um, meeting time so that we meet uh, uh, Mr. McFadden's Chairman Nunez, demands. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, that actually does not fall under the purview of the subcommittee if we're talking about uh, general funds. If we're not talking about public benefits money, um, then it actually doesn't fall under the public benefits subcommittee. Maybe Mr. McFadden's, a portion of Mr. McFadden's question may, you're right, uh, but a, maybe a portion of his, because he wanted to discuss the issue of public benefit let, funds. Let, let me come back and clarify that. Uh, Marion is exactly correct. Mm -hmm. I was referring to, I thought we had a subcommittee dealing with the budget, that it was going to the budget, not the subcommittee on public benefits. Okay. Um, All right. And, so, and we can calendar that uh, for the, bu the budget subcommittee, no problem. All right. I was referring to. Get on that. And I would also like to That's make clear. another point, which is, one of the things that we're trying to do is to take a look and figure out, okay, we see these renewable portfolio costs coming. We see them, I mean, I'm going to use the term going through the ceiling in the next few years because the second compliance period of 2014 through 2016, that requirement goes up to 25%. And for the last compliance period, 20. 2017 through 2020, that requirement becomes 33%. We've got a, a state government who is currently looking and talking about not only 40%, but 50%. And we are very concerned about what that is going to do to our ratepayers. We are all ratepayers. We live in the, we live in the valley. We pay electric rates, IED's electric rates. So our concern is if you turn around and you give a 50 million or 60, 70 million dollar rebate to the customer, and of course this is all at the board's discretion, but if we do that, then they have money in their pocket today. But when that base, when that rate increases over the next few years, they're gonna be looking at four, five, six cent ECA rates if they don't have these funds to offset those costs at that time. So I just, I just wanna give that to you as a little food for thought. That That is what staff is thinking about, and we are actually, We've got the customer is, is what we think about when we're putting these things together. Sandra. You're welcome. Any yeah. more questions? Yes. Um, on the base rates or ECA? Yeah, we have a question here. Go ahead, Mr. 
uh, going along the lines of what Mr. McFadden said, I <clears throat> it's been tough going through the ECA, discussing this through the years, and the best way to give it back, I believe, is not to not to collect it. So I would urge <laughs> the subcommittee to look at maybe the 2.85 percent that we charge that the ID voluntarily kept the or uh, the public benefits going is that a 2.85 percent not be applied to the ECA rate which is going to be floating but only to the base rate which is a, a standard and then I had one question for Mrs. Ainsworth uh, the 56 million you're giving back to the ratepayer between the reserves and the over collection you're also adding a 1% increase or once an increase is another 35 so the company has grown 91 million dollars in one year No, we haven't grown 91 million. The renewable power supply cost, which the ECA, that has increased yep. by approximately 25 million. Uh, we've had continuing pressure, upward pressure on all costs, operating costs. So I've been at the district for 12 years now. Of course, we haven't had a base rate increase and costs have not gone down. Gone down. They continue to increase and what we've been doing is we've been living on reserves. Our reserves are not necessarily looking so great at this point and so we need to get those cash reserves built back up. Um, as a matter of fact, I believe we're projecting by year end that for the energy department, our working capital cash account will be in the red, will be in the negative. And we've gone through as part of this budget process, we've gone through and to be fiscally sound, we, we've taken a look, which the Energy Department has done subsequently over the last six years since I've been in the Energy Department, looking where we can reduce costs. And we continue to do that. And to be frank, this budget that's before you, you're going to have two operating managers that are saying there's not enough money in this budget, that we have taken out critical necessary functions in this budget. So I just want to make the point that you know, we're watching those costs and we haven't increased 91 million. Again, I just want to make the statement that part of the need for the increase is being driven by the two financial metrics, which is keeping our cash levels where they need to be at $125 million operating level. Um, in the summertime, with power supply costs, what they are, that's three months worth of operating cash. In addition, we've got the requirements to have two times debt service coverage. So if we're not able to meet that over time, our credit rating will decrease and that will end up costing us more money when we do need to go to the market for bonding due to any of these large infrastructure projects that we've got to build. As we all know, this is a very capital intensive industry and when we're building some of these large projects like a generation or a transmission project, we're not talking about millions, we're talking about tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. So we generally try and fund those through debt funding and that also assists us as we're putting together rates for the future because we don't want today's ratepayers to have to pay for the assets that are going to be of value to customers over the next 30 years. <clears throat> yes, in the budget, I know the, the subcommittee will be looking at this. Ms. Ainsworth, if you have your budget in front of you, I'm looking at page D44. Uh, you talked about O&M picking up some of these costs. It has energy operation administrative. Uh, staff is... Uh, you have a total of five people, but the request is for 10 vehicles <laughs> on page D45. We have a pool. Yeah, we have an internal pool. So what happens there in an effort probably four years ago to consolidate resources and try and downsize the fleet, what we did is instead of at, at Valley Plaza, there's offices all over the place. So instead of each office having their individual vehicles, what we did is we consolidated one pool that the administration group is responsible to manage. So those cool. are pool vehicles. And we actually downsized. We got rid of approximately uh, 14 vehicles when we did that. So you don't you don't have a regular motor pool that you can spread more than ten. Somebody manages something like an Avis rent a car where you have like fifty vehicles, just ten. We have I'm sorry, we have a centralized fleet services at headquarters, but it's a little difficult when people need vehicles in the Valley Plaza. You don't want them to have to drive to Imperial to get a car. It's just not very efficient. So that's what we've done is made sure we've also got some vehicles available at IB Plaza. Thank you. Question? Go ahead. Uh, we, yeah. 
Is there a question? Long in. Uh, who's, who's up? Go, you are. Who's go up, ahead. Freddie? You're up. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Go um, ahead. I have a question that you may not. This isn't germane to a lot of this, but the do all utility companies have uh, a public benefits charge, or is it something unique to? the valley or to iid well be prior to 1231 2011 all california utilities did have pbc now i'm going to need to look to diana rosas for a level imp more information about how that has transformed over this last year hi diana rosas energy management strategic marketing section all utilities in california have public programs offered to uh, the residents they are funded differently some have a pbc charge others fund them through regular operate operation and maintenance budget but they all offer public programs they're just funded differently mm -hmm. so where they don't have public benefits they would essentially be funded through their base rates uh, i have a question all right mr mcfadden go ahead I just want to say again that I clearly understand the things that you brought up tonight. I think one of the biggest challenges is educating the community and justifying what you're doing because the people in this room, I don't think are all on the same page on justification for what, what's happening here. You may need it, you may be looking out to the future, but how do we explain this to the normal rate payer on the street? They are uninformed and maybe they don't understand this information that's on their uh, bill there's a disconnect nobody want to believe that but there's a disconnect of understanding from the community about the increase in the rates and my thing is hey let's explore and have these discussions but I say to you if this passes and the board goes along with it after all these lies they've told during the election, the general public do not understand what's happening. And I think there needs to be more education to the people. You go out and knock on doors and talk to people on the street, not the people in this room. And I just said that I don't think everybody in this room understand. So I know damn well that if everybody here don't understand, the community clearly not going to understand. We need to figure out, and I think staff is probably having a challenge with it, to break this down in the most simplest terms. Mr. Abadi said, maybe we don't even need it. I said, look at public benefits, and if we look at both of those and you still decide to do it, and it's a board decision, I understand that. The board decided to do it, I still say we need to figure out a way to educate the general public, the ratepayers that everybody talks so much about. You know, I rest my case on that. I understand you from a financial point. I understand the points that you've made. And I'm just saying that it sounds good from your perspective, but when you get out in the community and talk to people, they do not understand it. <clears throat> Mr. Uh, hey, yeah. We'll go to Gil, and then we'll go to Mr. Abadi. Go ahead, Gil. I agree with what uh, Mr. McFadden is saying. It's going to be very difficult to explain to the people that you're lowering the rate or giving them back money and then trying to raise it again on the, on the other end. How are you going to explain that to the people? It doesn't make sense. And that's going to be very, very difficult for us to explain to the people that on one hand, you say you're giving them back money, and the other hand, you want to raise their, their rates more. So it just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Mr. Abadi? <clears throat> yes, I just want to clarify something, Mr. McMahon. I didn't say it didn't need public benefits. I just said, as the other the young lady, I can't remember her, Coachella, her name, said that other people have different uh, uh, formats of public benefits, and they usually paid out of the base rate. And my idea was a 2.85 be applied to the base rate only and not a floating ECA portion. Might be a little bit less, but we draw our programs by the most needy. But it wasn't about getting rid of the okay. public benefits. I respect okay. that. I respect that. My apologies. Thank you for clearing that up. Okay, any, no further questions in El Centro? Okay, back to you, Laquinta. 
All right, then so that takes us through the base rate revenues. Then we've got other operating revenue and income and what we're projecting is a reduced reduce revenue coming from the willing and dispatching charges. We um, have a couple of generators who we're actually gonna take their power. So uh, we'll be, we've entered into purchase power agreements with them and they'll no longer be willing energy. So we'll receive the benefit on the power supply side from that. So in, in summary, we're projecting a total of $476 million or $477 million revenue versus the budget of $435 million for 2012. Then if there are no more questions there, I'm going to go ahead and move on to slide six. This is the final slide. This is a very high level slide just to show you that when we take a look at our total ev revenue including interest income that we would receive from investments less our expenses uh, including debt service then what the board did is the board passed a resolution in the 2012 budget process that included setting aside 0.05%. Let me take a step back. As part of the ECA calculation, as part of the public rate schedule, the formula actually includes running the cost through. And once you've run the cost through and given um, a credit for any wholesale revenues, then you come down to your initial rate per KWH. Then right off of that, you subtract an additional almost one cent. There's a uh, embedded in there, 0 0.0099 cents. That further reduces the ECA. So what the board directed staff to do was to go ahead and set aside half of that, essentially close to half a cent, aside, and they called it the balancing authority reserve. And what they wanted to do is set those funds aside that they, so that they can only be used to preserve our balancing, authority, uh, balancing area. So that's what the 16.3 million is. So we've we've reduced that amount out, showing that without those funds, uh, then in addition, we're looking at bringing in 13.2 million dollars of the current fund balance account for to fund programs for 2013. So when you net those figures all out, you come up to a figure of 41.7 million that after operations is available for capital. And then when you add the 41.7 back to the balance in authority reserve, uh, that gives you approximately $58 million that, that you really have coming in if you include transmission projects. And as I previously went over with you, the capital budget is right at, I believe, approximately 80, $87 million. So uh, the assumption is that we would bring in uh, approximately $25 million of commercial paper to fund some of those projects for the balance of that. Are there any questions on that slide? That's the final slide. So any questions on this slide or any other questions that you would like answered at this point? That was the last page, six. Yeah. Uh -huh. No further questions El Center, from El Center. None here. So I'd just like to tell you, the board uh, will be meeting. There will be a board meeting. It had, was canceled. Tomorrow's meeting has been canceled and rescheduled for this 27th of November after the holiday. And the budget will be presented at that meeting. In addition, the budget, the my understanding is that the board will be looking at, we're looking at three preliminary dates for budget workshops. We're looking at, uh, the budget will be presented on the 27th. We're looking at December 3rd at 5 p.m., December 10th at 3 p.m. Um, and the initial budget schedule had the budget then going back to the board right before Christmas for approval. So that's the tentative schedule. And once the board meets next week, I'd be happy to pass along the firm dates once they firm those up to this committee. Please do. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you. Okay, moving on to uh, budget subcommittee appointment. Uh, in La Quinta, we um, are appointing a member to our budget subcommittee, and Paul Gibson will be that person appointed uh, to that to the committee. So we'll uh, forward all information to Mr. Gibson. Is he there today by any chance? Yes, I am. Oh, hi, Paul. Um, there you are. Okay, great. Any uh, questions or anything, Paul? And we'll, t we'll uh, get you all the information via email, okay? 
Okay, moving on to the PBC update. Uh, Low-income programs, Mr. Scalera. Good evening, committee. I'm uh, not Mario Escalera. No, you're not. I'm uh, Robert Fugit. I'm, I'm the uh, superintendent for customer service, and I'll be stepping in for Mario. He was called away this mm -hmm. evening. Uh, I'm going to give you an update, uh, essentially, that we gave to our subcommittee on November 5th on the low-income uh, programs, especially uh, the residential energy assistance program and the emergency energy assistance program, and then I believe followed up by Diana Rosas uh, on our other programs. On your second slide uh, are the program budgets for uh, 2012 and 2013. As you can see, the uh, budget for 2012-2013 is going to essentially remain the same except for going to be a reallocation of funds according to customer participation for 2013. So in 2012, there was $4.6 million allocated to REAP program and there will be uh, $4.4 million allocated in 2013 budget, or plan budget. And then the Emergency Energy Assistance Program, uh, there was a $950,000 budget in 2012, and we plan uh, to have $1.2 million in that budget in 2013, for a total of $5.6 million. So the budget is essentially re remaining the same. On slide three, we have a comparison of the REAP program from 2011. As of September 30th, there were 11,937 customers, and there was $2.8 million that was expended at that point in time. In May of this year, there were 11,200 customers participating in the Residential Energy Assistance Program and the actual 741, uh, 1,294. You can see as of September 30th of this year that we had uh, improved to 13,194 customers, an 18% increase, and the actual dollars expended in the program, $2.7 million. For our Emergency Energy Assistance Program, as of this last year in September, were 4,302 pledges of an actual $535,000 uh, budget or actual expenditures. May of this year, there were 2,211 pledges so far in the year and $224,593 spent. And as of September 30th of, of this year, there were 6,097 customers participating in the emergency assistance program and $571,054 expended. On your fourth slide, we have a, uh, the uh, EEAP pledges broken down by month for 2011 and 2012 to give you a snapshot uh, comparison. Uh, essentially to show you that we have some changes that we had made in the program as of May of this year, and we wanted to give you the history and show you the improvement. So as in July of this, of 2011, there were 443 pledges and uh, $54,246 spent. July of this year, 807 pledges, $82,177. This is a monthly comparison now. August of 2011, there were 715 pledges, or a total of $96,299. And August of 2012, this year, 1,036 pledges and $107,228. September. Question? Yes. May I interrupt, please? Um, I don't want, to go, want you to go on too much further. Could you explain to me what a pledge is? Yeah, I have that in a subsequent slide, what the, sl the pledges are. No, what is it? What is well, it? the pledge is when a customer is in, is, uh, in jeopardy of turnoff uh, on their electric bill, then, we, then they can call in and they can get a pledge to their, bi to their bill. 
uh, to offset the amount so that they will not be disconnected. So IID makes a pledge to pay the bill for them? Is that is that? We are one of, of many agencies that make a pledge to uh, pay the bill, part right. of the bill. Okay, thanks. Are you saying that other organizations besides IID make up those pledges? I know the answer. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I, and I list some of those agencies here a little bit later also. Okay. In September of uh, 2011, and this again is just to show the difference in one year to another and uh, the improvement due to program changes. So in September of 2011, there were 469 pledges, there were $66,311 expended, and this year in September, 1,117 pledges at $117,897. A significant improvement. I'm going to talk a little bit about the REAP participation in that program before I go on to the changes that were made in the program. So this is also a monthly snapshot. In July of 2011, there was $476,930 expended in the program. As of 2012, same, about the same number of customers, 11,627 cust uh, customers participating. $482,049. In August, it was just under 11,000 customers. And in uh, this year, we've increased to just under 13,000 customers in August. If you look at September of 2011, before program changes, there were 10,892 customers participating, $527,667 expended. And for 2012, 13,194 customers now participating in the Residential Energy Assistance Program and the expenditures of 543,215. So if you look at slide six, and here's the answer to uh, the changes that we had made. As of June in 2011 billing, uh, the Residential Energy Assistance Discounts for non-seniors, we changed them from 15% to 20%, and seniors 65 years of older are a 30% discount. Uh, Non-seniors renewal annually for each time that they move, and seniors now renew every two years. Uh, we extended out the REAP expiration dates to flatten out uh, the amount of work in the seasonal peaks uh, in the program and give customers an additional time to renew. So customers now have more time to renew uh, for the program. The EEAP pledges are now quarterly, and they're $125 a quarter for a possible $500 annually overall. But in May, before May 1 of this year, the summertime pledge was $200, and a wintertime pledge was $150. So the program was $350 potentially for a customer per year. So there's been an increase of $150 annually for a customer. On your seventh slide, on customer outreach, uh, just an overall summary of the things that uh, have happened since your last update. Uh, of course, we have uh, REAP and uh, EAP representatives that are located in all of our uh, IID pay stations in Calexico, Brawley, La Quinta, El Centro divisions, and that's for customer convenience. Uh, for the third quarter of 2011, uh, there were 5,448 walk-ins. This is a question that was asked, I believe, this last time. And through the third quarter of this year, it's about the same, 5,614 walk-ins. So traffic has remained about the same. However, we have uh, instituted awareness uh, campaigns. So we have refreshments out in the lobby on our REAP day, which is every Friday. We have campaign buttons that uh, promoted the program, fans that we handed out to customers promoting the program. There have been quarterly uh, updates uh, in our bill stuffer, where when you get your invoice from IID for your electric bill. We have posters in all of our division offices. And then uh, we call customers now to remind them before their, uh, their uh, REAP application uh, expires. And of course, the last item we had, uh, we have dress shirts now that promote the campaign for REAP uh, 
that all of our customer service representatives wear on that Friday to promote REAP. On the eighth slide, you have some of the, of the uh, community outreach. Uh, we've given presentations and or had a presence with uh, Catholic Charities in El Centro, El Centro Senior Center, the Sealy Community Center, uh, IVROP, uh, the Date Festival uh, earlier this year, Imperial Valley <coughs> Disaster Response Team, IV Dirt, um, Riverside County Children's Services, the Counselor Resource Center of the Desert, uh, the Camp Out, Sister Evelyn Morey Center, the California Midwinter Fair, Children's Fair, and then to quite recently Pueblo Unido and out of MECA, who are uh, advocates for low income in the mobile home uh, segment of residential customers. Uh, the tenth slide, we have a listing of our partnering community agencies, uh, those agencies that uh, assist customers in need. Uh, Campesinos Unidos, uh, Sister Evelyn Morey Center, Catholic Charities, Woman Haven, Department of Community Action, Neighborhood House, and uh, we included the IID's toll-free number uh, at the end of that slide uh, in case you decide to call in and you want to talk to uh, somebody at IID. And I'm going to follow up a little bit later and talk about uh, uh, some changes there as well. Do we have any questions? Yes, we do. Question, go ahead. Mr. Flug, uh, Mike Abadi, uh, here on your page two, you say all includes all administrative costs. Uh, is that just IID administrative costs, and what percentage of that is of the 56 or 5.6 million? 5.6 million. Uh, that includes uh, just IID administrative cost. Uh, we, I do not believe we have any cost external. Uh, I'm going to look to Sherry McDonald over here, came along with me, uh, as to percentage. Uh, because I'm not really sure at that. I'm sorry, I do not have that, but I will get it. We can give, we'll provide that information to you then. Back through Marion. Okay, also your community outreach uh, partners that we have here, they also have an administrative cost. Do they do reporting on that? And can we get those figures too? To know what the total uh, administrative uh, cost that's not is? Reported to, that's not reported to us. Uh, these are partnering agencies that provide their own program. Okay. Independent of IID. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. No further questions here in El Centro? A uh, question in um, wherever we are. Mm -hmm. keen to. Um, in the, on page uh, three, page three. Uh, is showing a budgeted item of five million and an actual of 2.8, et cetera. Uh, why the disparity in, in the difference between the budget and the actual? Was this the first year that this was, uh, that this program was budgeted? Oh, that's the annual budget, and that was the, that's the actual dollars expended at that point in time. I know. I, 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 maybe I'm not making myself clear. Why is there so much disparity between the budgeted figure and the actual figure? Um, if you look down on the next line, it was budgeted $5 million, and we only used $741,000 of it. Why would you go with such a huge uh, budget number um, and, and have such a small actual number? That actual is for the month, the month of uh, May. So what would you do to make those numbers more realistic? To divide $5 million by 12? Well, if you want to make the numbers more realistic, I would say look at the September to September comparison. And then in uh, our, you know, the, the greatest activity in the both of these programs, Residential Energy Assistance Program and the EAP, happened in the months of July, August, up sure. through December, because yeah, that's when all that. those bills come from the summer. Now, when you're doing this budget this year, will you still use the five million budgeted item or will you go down to a 2.8 i'm trying to reconcile why you would use such a large number for a budget and end up with uh use a five million dollar number for a budget and a seven hundred and forty thousand dollar actual well that I means for the month you know all the parent well you know it's a month when you're doing the budget right 
So yeah. why wouldn't you compare apples to apples? Okay. Um, the outreach that we were trying to show was the improvement in outreach to, to customers, customer participation. But truly, these both of these programs are, are run of the river. They're, 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 the customers are in need, and customers participate, and it is due to their economic circumstance that they participate. And uh, we look at our mission is to go out and notify them, let them know the programs there, encourage them to become a participant in that program. But uh, that's what we do. And as far as the budget, that was uh, that's a projected number we're shooting for. So, so what you're saying, Bayard here, uh, is that I'm looking at it like Frank is, and, and I think what you're trying to show, correct me if I'm wrong, is that we've actually improved our outreach to the customers, we, so we have more people making use of the public benefit funds. Yes, sir. So the, the dollar amount would goes up or down depending on what they need. If, in other words, if we have 13,000 people, they all need $100, we need 1,300,000, 1, 1, but if they all need 500, we need five times that much. That is correct, sir. Thank you. Back. If I can. Thank you. So basically what you're saying is the public benefit subcommittee is doing what it's supposed to be doing, making sure that people get the word out and we're and and it's happening that is happening and we should have some very very favorable results at the end of year in your next update thank you okay no further questions here okay, thank you thank you much okay moving on to uh energy efficiency programs uh diana rosas please come up Good afternoon. My name is Diana Rosas, Energy Management and Strategic Marketing Unit. Today I will be providing an overview of our energy efficiency public benefits programs. This slide summarizes our existing programs. Our first program, Custom Energy Solutions Program, or CESP, is for our large non-residential customers and it offers incentives based on the efficiency measure. Current incentives are at nine cents per kilowatt hour for process loads, 11 cents for lighting, 14 cents for HVAC and refrigeration. Our second program is our new construction program. This is also a non-residential program that is aimed at new construction that provides both the customer and the design team with incentives for their energy savings that are at least 10% over the current Title 24 requirements. Our third program is our energy audits that consist of an assessment of a home and provides the customer with a report that contains recommendations for energy efficiency programs. Typically, these recommendations are no cost to low cost to the customers. Our energy rewards rebate program is our prescriptive program. Items are on our existing eligibility list include refrigerators, AC units, pool pumps, dual ping windows, attic fans, and insulation. Next program is our Open for Business Small Commercial Program. This is a weatherization program that provides up to $2,500 worth of energy efficiency measures to business owners. This is hugely successful. We've actually recently went to the board for additional funds for our second phase, which we uh, project will be fully subscribed by the end of the year, or actually early December. Our next program is a pilot, a Keep Your Cool pilot, and it's a small direct install pilot focusing on refrigeration measures. These can include door gaskets for the refrigerator doors, lighting and casings, etc. This program targets primarily small convenience stores, so your AMPMs, those type of, of businesses. Our next program is our LEAP program. This offers financial assistance to public schools who replace inefficient lighting and or HVAC systems. Each school can receive up to $35,000. Each application for this program was processed using our total resource cost test and awarded accordingly. This year, we plan on awarding over $1 million for this particular program. Our last program is our we residential weatherization program, and it provides um, resident cu uh, residential customers up to $1,000 worth of energy efficiency measures. Lo income qualified customers can participate for free, whereas other residential customers have to pay a $100 fee for the program. Any questions on this slide? 
Freddie, I'll ask one. On the last item, uh, weatherization, what, what would be what would make up that? Um, weatherization, uh, energy efficiency expert, a third party contractor goes to the home, uh, performs an energy audit, and lists energy efficiency measures that are not already installed in the home, lists them for the customers. This includes, it could be an AC maintenance, it could be weather stripping, it could be um, shade screenings, and the customer can receive up to $1,000 worth of these measures installed at their home. Any other questions? Okay. Next slide, slide three. Our 2012 energy savings target is 16,480 megawatt hours. We expect to surpass our goal based on projects that are currently in the final inspection phase as well as our two most po popular programs which are the direct install and residential weatherization. These programs, as I mentioned, um, have been highly successful. They're either no cost to low cost to the customers and usually fully subscribe within the first three months. Any questions on this slide? This shows a breakdown of our projected savings for each of our programs. Yeah, I have one. On, on the AC trade-up, it says 2011. What's the plan for 2012? That was a couple of installations that carried over from last year's program. And since we paid out the rebate this year, we had to claim the savings this year. Question over here, Mr. Bodic. On the, uh, your projected savings is 21,792 megawatt hours? That's correct. What is, uh, Mr. Valenzuela, what does that break down to per megawatt at uh, an expenditure of 12 million? So 12 million divided by 22,000 megawatt hours. Is that 22? 12 million divided by 22? But, they, but you know, I know it, you could do it that way per megawatt, but the way the um, energy efficiency groups looks, looks at each different program, they look at it a little bit differently. <coughs> when they actually do cost savings on each program that have to meet different ratio types, so they don't look at it the same way as we do as, as per megawatt savings. So if you were to do that, it would probably be, um, well, I don't have my calculator, but it it would probably be pretty costly, but if you're trying to compare that to what we would pay for energy at that time, um, it's kind of not real, comp you can't really, it's not apples to apples, because they look at each different program, and they have different ratios that they look at that actually tell them if the program makes sense or not. Okay. And that's based on industry standard or yes, something? Yes, they like have that? industry standards that I don't know. Yes, that's that correct. Diana, is it like the one The total point? resource cost test, yes, it's a TRC. The same, it, we use the same industry standard. I think it was presented to the ECAC back in December of last year. Um, it's the total resource cost test. It's the same. It takes into consideration capacity-related costs that are avoided due to the energy efficiency measure, um, other resources that we're saving, um, it includes free ridership, the the ratio of the cost to the customer versus the utility. And as far as the resource planning group would be concerned, when we look at actually going out and buying megawatts and, and replacing that with some, that, that would actually be demand side management programs. What Diana's kind of going through here is energy efficiency programs, which are more related to these, the, these type of um, industry standard ratios. So if we ever got a real true demand side management program on, um, where you know you could actually interrupt people's um, mm -hmm. energy and stuff like that. That is what you could actually compare to what the um, the peaking um, price of power is at that time. No further. Any questions? other questions on this slide? Okay. Not, not from El Centro. Okay, uh, moving on to slide four. This is a, a breakdown of our existing 2012 budget by program along with the forecast. Um, as you can see, our budget is a little bit shy of 14.2 million and we expect to um, spend about $12 million of our budget. A 
question over here, Mr. Yeah. Perez? <clears throat> if you if you look down on the on that page uh, where it says um, quality AC uh, maintenance, who are you referring to? Are you referring for residential or commercial? This is a 2013 program that I will be discussing in a future slide. The amount that is listed here is um, to start with our bidding process to get all of our program implementation plans and to start some of the quality assurance set up for the program. That is what the budget for 2012 was intended for, but it's a 2013 program. Yeah, but. And it will be for residential customers. For residential customers. Because that's yes. a lot of difference, between 105000 to 25000 No, no, no. Our budget, yes, because we, we planned on starting the bidding process earlier in the year. We actually got started a little bit uh, third quarter. That's why the, the forecast is a little bit less than the budget. But the actual program won't be effective until uh, maybe March of 2013, the actual program. And that was always the intention, to start the program in 2013. These costs are program development and implementation costs. I thought we had that program before. We did have it, I believe, four or five years ago. It hasn't been offered in the last three. Uh, Diana, can you explain the AC trade-up? Uh, what, what? I can see the budget and the forecast. I don't know what it's going to do. Oh, that's the same. It's it's the 2011 program. We had uh, carryovers from last year, <clears throat> and that's what the the cost represents. So now that's going to continue. No, no, no. The forecast is actually the actual. We those are costs that we incurred this year from last year's program. That that should remain the same. It won't change. Okay. From now till the end of the year. We will not be offering the AC trade-up program. We will be offering a third tier to our existing energy rewards AC program that I'll discuss in a future slide, similar to the AC trade-up. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, on to slide five. This is a breakdown of our budget by funding source. This is for this year, 2012. Um, as you can see, 6.2 million of the budget came from the PBC, the collection of this year, 2.4 from our fund balance, and then we had um, $700,000 worth of capital projects funded through PBC and 4.8 from fuel and purchase power for a total of 14 million. And as I mentioned in my previous slide, we expect to spend about 12 million of our budget this year. Any questions on this slide? Okay. Slide six. This is our proposed 2013 energy efficiency program portfolio. All of these are currently being offered with the exception of the quality AC maintenance program highlighted in blue. Um, this program will be offered to residential customers um, and we will be providing maintenance to their AC units. We've gone out to bid, we've presented to, um, we've gone out to bid for both the program administration and the quality assurance portion of it. We'll have two separate portions for this program. Um, the administration portion was actually presented to the evaluation committee last week and we will be scheduling to move forward for board approval for the uh, program administration. Um, changes to note for the 2013 programs are the energy rewards. As I mentioned a couple minutes ago, we will be adding a third tier to our um, HVAC system rebate. We will be adding a third tier at $500 per ton of anything over 16 SEER. And it's a SEER ear combination. That's one of the changes. So that is. Um, the alternative to the AC trade-up program. So what we did is we were, we're adding the third tier. It's $100, $100 for tier one and $145 for tier two. The third one, we are planning on doing a $500 per ton. I'm sorry, I, I meant on the, what do you have, what was the SEER requirement for 
the hundred dollar and the one forty five. Um, the hundred dollar, I don't have that information with me, but it's a combination of the sear and ear, so it's not necessarily just the sear and it's um, the heat pump. It's a little bit different, but I could forward that information to Mary and she could thank you email it be, to everyone. Be nice for the committee to know so they could talk about it. Okay, great. Um, another change is on the CESP program. We'll be splitting our lighting incentive in two. Uh, we will be offering 11 cents for on-peak savings and four and three cents for off-peak savings on the CESP program. Any other questions on this slide? Okay. This slide lists our proposed 2013 budget. Um, as you can see, the budget is in line with our existing 2012 approved total. Um, our next slide will actually show the, the breakdown of this by funding source. Okay. Okay, slide eight is the budget 2013 proposed budget by funding source. 5.3 million is coming out of the public benefits charge collection for next year, and we plan on using 9.3 of the fund balance that we have right now. Um, we're still not close with October, the month of October, but preliminary numbers show that we have about 19 million in the reserve. Um, we plan on spending 9.3 million of that next year, so um, our total will be 14.6, which is in line with what we currently have. And with this slide, I conclude my presentation. I will be glad to take any questions from the audience or committee members. Any questions, El Centro? Doesn't yeah. appear, uh, wait, uh, Mr. Pettis. Okay. What, what down at the bottom of the page you have does not include <clears throat> S, SB1 program, what is that? That's our, our, our photovoltaic rebate, our solar program. And it's funded through a different category, and, and that's why I did not include that information. Okay. No further questions from El Centro. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Diana. Okay, moving on to, wow, coordinator's report, Marion. Actually, I think we skipped the did I department skip? update. Yeah. What did I skip? Oh, I sure did. Uh, d department update. Mario Scalera, okay. sorry. Bob, do you get uh, yeah, Bob. superintendent of the customer service? And I'm standing in again for Mario Escalera once again. Thank you. Uh, Mario asked that I give you an update on the interactive voice response unit, IVR. Uh, this is a hardware, software system that uh, IID has in our call center. Uh, we have not upgraded it since 2006. Uh, we started the project at the beginning of this year with a budget of $597,000, still under budget. And we completed the first phase of the project, which was an IVR uh, itself, in uh, this October. And then we are in the last stages of upgrading the IVR on what is called an outbound dialer. The ability to call customers uh, in the event of uh, when they're, where they're going to get turned off, we'll give them a 48 hour notice so they can pay their bill. They can pay their bill through using the automation in the IVR or talk to an agent to do so. Uh, scheduled outages where we can take a list of customers from a circuit map and we can turn that into a file that we can pull their phone numbers from our, our accounting system and we can call them and tell them that they're going to be out on such and such date at such and such time and be prepared so that we no longer have to put out our mail uh, notices to the customers called door hangers. It's an extremely expensive operation. Uh, the third part of the third campaign on this outbound dialer is to uh, give customers a return call if they so desire a after an outage and make sure that they, in fact, are on or off. So we can send somebody out and have a truck roll if they're still out. So uh, 
been very successful so far, very few hiccups along the way. Uh, this is probably one of the cleanest projects I've been involved in a long time, and I'm happy to say that because I'm responsible for the project. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, that's a good success story there. And um, Mario had said that if you, the committee wanted this too, we could come back with an update uh, next month, early part of this next year, to give you a full update. Thank you. Thank Question? you, Bob. Any questions? Yes, in, uh, in La Quinta? Yes, go ahead, Lum. La Quinta. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a question on it. Is that, when that does a dial out, is that a recorded or is it a human being calling everybody? It is a, well, we can do it two ways. We can do a text to voice where we have an automated voice go out with a message that we pre-prepared in text, or we can record a message and we can put it on our system and they can dial out with that automated message. And if someone wants uh, to talk to a human being, we can set it up so that they can get, uh, they will end up with an agent. Okay. If they're uh, available. Bob, if they're, uh, does it leave a message at a voicemail? It will leave a message. The, the, the system is intelligent enough to recognize whether it's getting an answering machine a person or somebody hung up on them. And it will do a second try uh, and then it will it will uh, turn itself off. So it will not leave a message on to a voicemail? The voice it will message. leave a message on a voicemail, yes. Oh, okay. All right. And what does it say on the phone on the caller ID? It will say Imperial Irrigation District. That very good, thank you. It won't say political call or something like that? No, me. nothing like that. Okay. Uh, the beauty of this is that uh, in the automation that we've been trying to answer as many of our customers that call in as possible, uh, in any given month we have some 50,000 customers on average that call in, so it's very difficult to catch all of those calls. Uh, the automation portion or the automated portion of the our old IVR would pick up anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of the calls and we are anticipating that this system will pick up about 40 percent of the calls via automation so we can serve more customers. Thank you. Thank you Bob. Okay now we move on we've moved on to the coordinators report Marion. Thank you. Uh Chairman Nunez, Marion Champion, ECAC coordinator. Just wanted to draw attention to um, your packets. There were several things in there, uh, more from information standpoint, your November attendance report, uh, your ECAC seats and rotation schedule since we are coming upon the end of the year, a copy of the Public Benefits Subcommittee mi minutes from our meeting earlier this month, a copy of the 2013 meeting calendar, and then I also wanted to make note that um, I did email all of you about the El Centro uh, Unit 3 repower uh, dedication ceremony that will be taking place next Tuesday. Um, I did send some invitations inside your packets, uh, but I wanted to extend that uh, invitation out to all the ECAC members uh, once again. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. I'd like to congratulate Esther Gomez on being with perfect attendance for a year. I've been driving for that for a long time. <laughs> I'm here tonight not feeling well, but I'm here. So, so congratulations, Esther. Thank you. Job, Esther. Thank you. All right. Uh, then moving on to members' comments at La Quinta. Go ahead. We'll continue with La Quinta. Uh, yes, uh, Blum. Um, my term is up uh, December of this year, and uh, I'm not going to run to, to re-up, so I just wanted to let the committee know. Ah, thank you, Mr. Vaughn. Okay, um, any more looking to members? No more? Okay, then uh, we'll move on over here to Ms. Thomas to my left. Oh. Your members comment, Merlin. Uh, really no real comments. I have enjoyed um, s serving for the past uh, year or so on the committee, and uh, my term is quickly coming to an end, and um, I, too, will not, although I've spoken with the uh, new director, I will not be um, requesting uh, to extend my membership, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you. No comment. No comment. Mr. McFadden? 
Um, I want to say too that uh, I've enjoyed the opportunity to serve on this committee. My term's up, and uh, I recognize that uh, there may be another appointment uh, taking my place. So I just want to say thank you to the committee and uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McFadden. <clears throat> yes, uh, just want to congratulate the new elected members. None of them are here, but I wish them well. I hope they'll do what they promised during the election. Thank you. Mr. Perez. No comment. No comment. Esther? No comment. Mark, uh, comment? Mr. Roddick? No comment. Okay, well, uh, I want to congratulate Mr. Gibson for this appointment to the sub budget subcommittee, and that's it from me, and uh, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>